discuss the ins, discuss the outs, and let's talk about. Let's talk about. Let's talk about. Welcome to Let's Talk About the Arts, presented by myself, Fergal Curtis. I'm going to address the elephant in the room. My guest is sitting beside me, the beautiful Claire O'Malley, who we are going to chat to momentarily. But first, I just wanted to kind of address the direction that Let's Talk About the Arts is going in. So I had an interview last year with the beautiful Naomi Louisa O'Connell. And from that interview, it just kind of re-sparked why I started Let's Talk About the Arts. And then I kind of took a little break and I went off and did some things and I did other projects. And during that time, I was like, do you know what? Maybe it's time to just leave. Let's talk about the arts. Let's just let it be where it was. And then coming into 2022, I was like, no, I have. I want to explore this more, create a bit more. So I kind of have changed up the structure. So each episode, I'm going to invite a guest on. I'm going to ask them to share with me three things that represent themselves as an artist. So that could be a memory, a quote, a poem, a musical, a song. It can be anything and it can represent them as the artist they are today, the artist they were or the artist they hope to be. Um, And we're just going to sit down and have a chat about the three or more, if they like, um, things that they gave me. um, And we're going to just explore them. Yeah, sound let's, good? Let's do it. Cool. So today I'm joined by the gorgeous Clara Malley. We're not going to do any major introductions, but I encourage you to go and check her out. You'll find her. Um, Google stalk. Google stalk her. <laughs> she's, she's dancing around on the Facebook and the Instagram. She's there. But I'm going to give a little context to how I know Claire and why I asked Claire to be here. So I know Claire from many, 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 many moons ago when we were very young um, and we were in stage school together and we did like Mm Amdram and that's kind of how we were introduced to each other. Then we both went on our own journeys. Claire spent a lot of her time in Philadelphia and New York. I spent my time in Dublin and London. And then in the last couple of years, we just kind of reconnected Mm -hmm. because I did ask you to come on the podcast. Oh my gosh, yes. And that was our first Zoom of kind of reconnecting with each other. That's so true. That like towards the, you know, the pandemic is all just a wash now. Yeah. It was like the beginning of it. So that's how we kind of reconnected. And that didn't happen for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember. But then... We started talking and we started going, hmm, what if we could do this or that or loads of little things. And then Claire asked me to be a guest on her cabaret that she had just before Christmas. And we had so much crack. So much. We had so much fun. And we got to sing together And we got to sing together, which was beautiful. And we've just kind of reconnected. So I wanted a friend on for the first episode. And I also have been a huge admirer of yours of your talent, of your work ethic, of your... Listen, I'll, it, we'll go into it all throughout <laughs> the episode. So, hello. Hello, it's me. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. The setup is beautiful. Thank you. You're beautiful. Thank yes, you. Thank we're you feeling for good. Yes. We're all, I was saying to Claire, I am a little bit nervous. This is the first time I've done like a setup like this, <laughs> but... I'm it's, excited. It's fabulous. It's, it's a new fabulous. direction. Yeah, these chairs are comfy. The tea's great. It'll be good chat. Nice. So we're going to jump into the kind of three things. I need to come up with a better word than things. But the three elements mm-hmm. that you gave me. Sure. And we're going to start with a quote that you took from the musical Cabaret. I did. Yes. Music by John Kander. Lyrics by Fred Ebb. And book by Joe Masteroff. Yes, it was originally a play called I Am A Camera. And then it got turned into a musical. Oh, nice. Um, based around, like, or, or centered around, uh, pretty sure, like, before World War Two and during. Um, and then slightly into the aftermath. I'm actually not sure if it goes into it. But it's yeah. a beautiful, dark musical with substance which is why i love it 
And what's exciting about this is it's actually on in London at the moment with one yes. of my favourite artists, which is Jessie Buckley. I absolutely <gasps> love her. Me too. Have you I seen her in Wild her. Rose? Yes, she's incredible. Oh my God. I just watched that movie and I'm obsessed with the soundtrack. Yeah. I should have put one of those songs in. Yeah, actually. they're great songs. Like the song about about Glasgow. Yes. Is incredible. I was going to do that in the cabaret. No way. Yes, yes I was going to put that at the stunning. end. It's <gasps> stunning. I, I love her. I've loved following her career from like yeah. the Nancy days. But anyway, mm-hmm. tell us what quote you took from this musical. Oh yeah, gosh, we digress so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> For, from Cabaret, it's a quote from Sally Bowles. Yeah. Um, and I played her in uh, sixth year, no, fourth year in school. Did not know that. And I, the quote is, people are people. And it's in a longer context of, she says, I think people are people, Cliff. I really do, don't you? I don't think they should be made to apologize for anything they do. And then she goes into this long monologue and then she has a song. And I did it when I was first, like, so what? I was maybe 16, 15. And I loved that. It just gave me so much of an insight into her and her essence and how she felt about the world. And I've always thought you know, what a great way to see people. And I've always felt that was like what resonated with her and myself. You know, you try and look for a thread between characters. Yeah. And I was like, I also think people are people. And as I've grown up and as I've like grown up as an artist as well, I've noticed that I see that differently, that quote even more now. And I understand it more and its complexities and actually how naive a little bit of it is. Because yes, people are people, but also some people have it easier than others. And there's a lot of, um, you know, where you grew up, where you're from, all these things, all these factors shape you. And I don't know, I I probably sound like I'm rambling now a little bit, but the, the quote is important to me. Do you want to tell us maybe what that quote means to you today? Because I kind of just Mm. threw at you like... Give me some quotes. Give me some memories. And I think you were like, what are you on about? Like, what do I do? And then you sent, this was the first one you kind of sent to me. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know why it popped into my, you know what? It's the title. So I just did a new, I just wrote for the first time, my uh, my first ever one woman play with music called Transatlantic Living. And one of the scenes in it is titled I titled all the scenes even though the audience don't get to know what the titles are but for myself and for the director we like to title them and one of the titles is people are people and it's a scene where I'm talking to my granny about uh why is everyone asking about my immigration status and it's 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 it makes me feel uncomfortable and she's like, oh, well, you're interesting. Be flattered. And I'm like, it feels invasive. Mm-hmm. And and she's saying people feel it their right to ask, where do you belong? And then I respond with, well, I think people are people. Uh, okay. And it's and then as I go through the journey, I learn that, yes, people are people. But, you know, everyone has it easy. Like some people have it easier than others. And yeah. there's race involved and like white privilege comes up. Yeah. And there's a lot in that quote. Let's talk about your emigration Um, because you lived a lot in New York and Mm -hmm. that was definitely a long kind of journey for you uh, becoming a citizen there. Yeah. What was it like being an Irish girl pretty much growing up in New York? Well, it's like your formative. In your 20s. Yeah, yeah. I do very much feel like, yeah, I the formative 20s were in America, both in Philadelphia and New York. I always felt a little, I don't know, when I, you know, when you and I were growing up, there was Amdram for musical theatre, but there was no Lear. No. There was no, we only really had the option of, uh, wasn't there like drama in English in Trinity? Or... Yeah, there was drama in English in Trinity, there was drama in DIT, there was the degree I did, which was classical singing. Right. Which you actually yeah, had but, gotten onto the course as well. Um, but there was, there was no musical theatre. No. And I always felt a pull towards musical theatre. Yeah. And so I like it was frustrating that I couldn't... I mean, I could have stayed, but it was frustrating that I, I couldn't stay and pursue that. Yeah. Um, so 
I went to America to do that and I felt comfortable because I was around like-minded people that also wanted to be musical theater and also I was in the land of musical theater yeah. where it's just you know it, it is like it formed over there and mm-hmm. so it's the best place to learn it so I felt I I, enjo- I really enjoyed my university experience over there I do you know something concept. I've always wanted to ask you yeah go and sorry for cutting over you no please where did that bravery and courage come from at 18 years old to hop on a plane and go because I couldn't have done it and looking back I was thinking about this today from all the group of people that we grew up with you were one of the ones who were like right I'm off to do it we've all talked about this for a year about wanting to be on Broadway or West End or whatever it was and then you know a lot of people did go away Mm -hmm. but you went away and really stuck at it what what was that maybe that's two questions maybe what was the bravery to do that and then what was the resilience to stick around gosh those are good questions i i don't know where the bravery came from because i didn't see it as brave and i actually still don't see it as brave i see it as privileged now that i could say i want to do this i'm going to get scholarships and I'm going to do this and I did I had my granny over there um so I could stay with her so I could get scholarships and then I could stay with her so I didn't have to pay for housing so that was a level of privilege right yeah and coming from Booterstown I'm I am my brain is able to think that way so it was that and also there's something that it feels like a necessity like a survival mechanism and I just don't know who I would be if I couldn't perform. And looking at the landscape of Ireland at the time, I wasn't going to be able to perform in what I wanted to do. And I tried out England Mm -hmm. and I didn't, I didn't fit in there. I, I did a couple of summers programs at, uh, and I auditioned for a couple of places in London and I just did not feel comfortable. Um, I felt the vibe was different from when I went to the States. That's very aware for a 17. I guess so. 18 year old to be. I guess so. I, I don't, I still don't really see it again. I don't really see it as brave, but I do look back at myself and, uh, you know, then you go through your twenties and then the rose tinted glasses get shattered towards America and towards life and you get beaten down Yeah. and you, you know, uh, you have life lessons that are so important. Um, and I did lose my confidence somewhere along the way. And I think I lost, I mean, I know that I lost some of it in the immigration process. Okay. Um, and then you build yourself back up again. And I only feel now that I'm starting to like get on my own train again, but you, everyone loses themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so fascinating because I see you as such a confident being, (laughs) You know, it's really interesting because it is interesting. you were that person <laughs> so interesting. when we were teenagers and I wasn't, we weren't present in each other's lives for a long, long time. Yeah. So I've missed all that. <laughs> and the Claire that I'm reconnecting with now, definitely I would know is, you know, has learned a lot about herself and has had an interesting journey. But again, is very confident. Like there's no... When you said, let's do a cabaret, and then it just wasn't really working out, you were mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do my own, yeah. and then we- we'll reconnect and do something <laughs> yeah. again. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. So confident, so resilient. It's because I don't, it's like, I feel like I don't have an option. I feel like I will not survive, and I will not, like, I can't function unless I am performing or creating so let me challenge you do you see yourself as an artist as a um, performer and that necessity do you see that as part of your identity yes very much do you think that that's healthy Uh, I do because I I do that's a really good question though because Because I don't interesting because of my journey I'm like being so attached 
to an output caused me a lot of issues. Mm. So hearing you, I'm like, you are an artist within your identity. I think And that's that, why I ask you that. I mean, I know myself and I know myself outside of, but so much of me is, is what I do and what I love. And it has, when I disassociate it from product and I return to the work, and the sculpting of a piece or the music, when I bring it right back to that, then it doesn't matter. I mm. actually, I've actually realized, like, as long as I'm creating, it doesn't matter where I am. Um, it really doesn't. I used to like hum and haw, oh my gosh, Ireland, America, Ireland, America. And now I'm like, I don't, I actually don't care. It's as almost long like as... the outcome doesn't matter as long as you're in the process creating. Right. And I've also realized that like, in order for you to grow and to, you know, move forward, it's uncomfortable and can be awkward and you have to fail. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jesus, easier said than done, you know, failing is terrifying. I was, I know we were talking about before, but uh, doing this show, the play that I just did performed, it was the first time ever that I spoke my own text in front of an audience and not only that but it was my own story so I couldn't hide behind a character or Mm -hmm. I couldn't hide behind and that's why I usually like to do this right I think a lot of us are drawn to it's like we want to express ourselves we don't know how so we pick a character and we can like use that as a vessel yes and I think that doing what I just did was one of the ballsiest things and I'm really proud of myself because it wasn't hiding behind a character. It was me that I was telling the story of. And that was terrifying. Mm. I mean, I was so nervous. But the high that I got afterwards and the growth that I feel now for writing in general uh, is great. And I want to continue on it. I love it. It's also this being proud of yourself is such a wonderful feeling. Yeah. And someone asked me two days ago. Or what are you proud of in your life? And I was like, well, that's a question. And just hearing you speak there, you're proud of yourself for doing this show. Mm -hmm. Is it the show and the output and maybe the response you're proud of? Or is it what you learned from putting that output out there? What is it you're proud of? Is it the show or is it how you grew from doing that? It's both. Okay. It's both. It's it's taking, it's clawing something from nothing in a pandemic when there's no work, no one is offering you a story to tell and, and saying, well, if no one's offering me a character, I can write one. And who do I know best? Myself. I'm going to write this story and I'm going to like be as candid as I possibly can and as entertaining because I think it's important Especially for one person shows, my God, yeah. can you be like me, me, me. And important for this day and age. Yeah. Like yeah. we want to be entertained. Can we please laugh for a second? Oh my God, absolutely. And not be like watching our traumas playing out on a stage and then feeling it. And then like I remember, Yeah. God. I think we went to a show in the gate and it was beautiful. It was a gorgeous show. But I came out and I was like, drained. I'm going home. And yeah. everything I was going to see was so heavy. And I think we want to be entertained. Oh, we want completely. To, you know? There's a fine line. And I think it's going to keep changing between like addressing it like the elephant in the room and then moving on from yes. that. So, yeah, it is interesting. It's very interesting. Um, for It's a crazy time for artists. Let's move on to your next point. Woo! I know. I'm like, have I just talked shite? No, you have not talked <laughs> shite. You've talked absolute genius. So... <laughs> The next, um, it's a song that Claire chose next. I'm even like, so it's called Anything Worth Holding On To. It's a song by the composer and lyricist Scott Allen, um, who also performed this song on his debut album called Anything Worth Holding On To. And there's an instrumental version at the end of the album, which is perfect for, oh yes, I've been singing along to it 
Because I'm like, right, Scott, you're great, but I need to hear. Yes. I need to feel these words. Because it's the most incredible song. The first time I ever heard the song was sung by Claire and in the cabaret that we were talking about there. And when you sang these words, which I'm going to read in a second, it was like, there it is. That's it. That is it. So I found a quote from Scott Allen from an article um, that I found on advocate.com. So I'm going to read this quote, but then I'm going to give you, he, he quotes the lyrics. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask you to read the lyrics. But the quote goes, so he's talking about a relationship ending and this longing for wanting a family and everything kind of has just fallen apart. So he says, but more than that, I found that the one constant in my life, writing, was suddenly not happening. It was like I'd been put on pause. I couldn't find the words. I couldn't hear melody. I felt trapped. Though I had so much to say, I couldn't find the right words with which to say it. I'd sit at the piano and nothing matched the emotions I felt in that moment. Mm. They were just words and notes. Words and notes without any meaning to them. To understand me is to understand one important thing. I write about my life and all that comes with it. To say that my music and lyrics define me is an understatement. I put every element of myself into song. All of my secrets, inner turmoil and celebrations are music. Can't say this word. Are musicalized it's my therapy day after day i kept sitting down at the piano hoping that some sort of genius idea would present itself then one day i started slowly writing again and claire if you would read the quote in Gosh, which part is bold it? oh yes when the life you had planned slowly slips through your hands when it feels like you just slept through all the best years of your life when you can't find your way oh no he's written something else here sorry i've got singing into it oh okay when you wake oh yeah when your heart's beyond repair when you wake and no one's there when your home consists of only you is there anything worth holding on to this was the first time he wrote this, so maybe they're now structured yeah, in different parts of the song. I was like, oh, I'm dying to know which part that he picked out of the song. Yeah. Um, and then the quote just finishes, just because I think it's important. He says, that's all I was able to write at the time. I couldn't find other words to describe how completely trapped I felt and how losing the ability to ex- explain it in song made me feel even lonelier. Mm, and God. then he goes on to talk about taking a complete break moving to Italy for a bit. Oh gosh, isn't that nice? Yeah, and those words and then the entire lyrics in the whole song are just incredible. Can you tell us, maybe tell us why you picked this song for the cabaret and why you wanted to present that? Because, and I, uh, because it got me out of a hole. So exactly what he said of like, he, it's his therapy. He pours everything into his writing. He pours everything into, uh, uh, I'm the same. And it's really nice to hear that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not great communicator, <laughs> even though I'm an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I am better at communicating through song usually or through someone else, like I said, someone else's text. Mm-hmm. And I this I chose it for you today because I thought I um, it was like my pandemic anthem. So I actually found this when I was in a really, really dark place uh, somewhere towards the end of the first year of the pandemic. So like December of 2020. Yeah. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but like, you know, relationships dissolving and it was just creatively like numb. Mm -hmm. And I was scrolling on YouTube and through musical theater songs, of course. And I came across Cynthia Erivo singing this live. Mm -hmm. And 
I found it and then I sat there, I would say for probably like, I don't know, 45 minutes, just watching it and listening on repeat. And I was very emotional because I was like, hey, I am not on my own. Whoever wrote this song, aka Scott Allen, I knew Scott Allen, but I was like, the person, the fact that there's someone writing this song and the fact that someone is performing it, Cynthia Revo is what I think one of the best, I think she's one of the best singers of all time, ever. I was like, I'm not on my own. There's other people out there that feel as shite as I do right now and as rock at rock bottom. And I thought it was a good anthem for creators in a pandemic because I know, I know that the pandemic has hit everyone like and in different facets in different ways. But there's something soul shattering about like the breath of the coronavirus and how singing is like deadly. And if you breathe on people singing, which is the one thing that like breathes life into me is this like deadly thing that you can do. And and I don't know, it was just like this whole thing has just been heartbreaking that I can't perform. So seeing and hearing that song, seeing Cynthia Riva do it, I was, that was the beginning of my crawling myself out of the hole. Wow. And so, and it was the first song that I recorded uh, for my YouTube videos, which I started to do because I was like, well, if I can't have an audience, I may as well embrace the technology yeah. and put stuff online. It was the first thing I ever put on my YouTube channel. Wow. And not only that, but on top of all of that, Cynthia Revo, I like I said, I think is just stunning human yeah. and singer. And I thought initially, I can't sing that. Mm-hmm. She does it. Why would anyone want to listen to Claire O'Malley singing this when Cynthia Revo sings this? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, this is the big. This is a huge challenge. Of like this is one of the biggest challenges of all time. Sing like your idol's song. <laughs> yeah. Like who does that? But I wanted to challenge myself, and I thought, well, if I pour myself and what I am connecting to into this song, then it will be uniquely me. And you know, people can compare and contrast all they want. I don't care if I pour myself into it. That's all I care about. And interesting about that is you were my Cynthia Revo. Oh my God. Oh my God. I heard you Can I it. get you to write that down? <laughs> no <laughs> problem. Can you actually... I will post on anything yeah. you want <laughs> me to. Can we make magnets of that? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Just bother. when I'm feeling shit, Virgil, I need that. <laughs> I'll record a little voice memo. You can just listen to it over you and over are again. Cynthia Revo. But it, it was, I was sitting there and I know it wasn't only me in the room because I spoke to people after, but when you were singing those words, it was like a collective everyone going, oh, Jesus. And I think it's <laughs> such a credit to Scott Allen because I've listened to some of his other stuff now. Yeah. And I had heard some of his stuff before. But there is something about the way he writes that makes you go, that's how I feel. Yeah. And there's a real simplicity in how he writes. Yeah. But I think that keeping big emotions and big experiences simple is the way that you communicate them with people. I think that's a very hard lesson to learn as an artist because you always want to dress it up and be intelligent and be artistic. And I think he does that perfectly. He keeps it simple, but by Christ. When the life you had planned slowly slips through your hand, deceased. Well, it's also like he wrote that before the pandemic and I and I plucked it out of obscurity because of the, those lines, because I was like, well, that is so pertinent to now. For me, it's a real anthem yeah. for people who suffer with mental health. Yeah, it's a real yeah. there are some words in it that I'm like, that explains things that I have gone through mm-hmm. that I could never put words to. Yeah. I'm That's just... why art the that it's so wonderful that you can pour that into your work. Yeah. And that's why a lot of us do what we do, you know? Mm-hmm. I always talk about how like a lot of artists are quite like introverted and people think that like a lot of actors are really in your face and whatever and maybe some of them are. They're not usually mm-hmm. my kind of people. <laughs> but like, you know, really good actors are are observing and listening and 
and taking it all in like a sponge so that we can replicate it on stage. It makes sense, though, because a lot of you see people performing and you're like, they must be extroverted. And it's like, think about the hours they spend on their own practicing. Think about the hours of preparation they spend on their own. There's a lot of on your own reflecting, preparing. Yeah researching time sitting with emotions figuring out how you express that before you even step into a room to collaborate and then step onto a stage to be an extrovert let's say yeah yeah you know it's interesting i mean i'm gonna move on to your third one because you kind of have touched on this actually in the last one and that's you kind of said about singing a song that your idol had sang and you're like well i'm gonna throw myself into it and I'm going to do it my way and the quote you have picked again is from a musical do you like musical theatre? Uh, yeah you know it's a kind bit of? too bit too happy clappy for me <laughs> <laughs> this is from one of my favourite <laughs> musicals um, it's from Sunday in the Park with George by Stephen Sondheim coming recently... to Dublin 2022 yeah starring Fergal Curtis and Clara Mally <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Just putting that out there into the world. Um, (laughs) But I will say Stephen Sondheim has passed away. And I'm really glad because we wanted to sing this at our cabaret. And there just wasn't enough time for it to be done in the way that I think we would have liked to have done it. Agreed, agreed. Um, And I think what we did... So we ended up with Frozen. <laughs> Love is an open door from Frozen. We went from Stephen Sondheim to Frozen. Yeah. That's how versatile we are, Fergal. Versatile. But we sang this once. Mm-hmm. In, um, by a piano. In a house. And it was just wonderful. So when you sent this to me, I was like, oh my God. And the reason we did want to do it is because I think it does... This story, in particular, the song Move On, I think it does sum up how we reconnected and the Hopefully. conversations we had. Hopefully. Anyway, please tell us the quote. Oh, God. All of a sudden, I, do you want like, me I to might forget it? it. Anything you do, let it come from you. Then it will be new. Give us more to see. It's just. And that. It's very simple, like you said. It's very So simple. simple. Yeah. But says the so music's much. not simple. <laughs> but it says so much. And it is something that I return to because uh, comparisons are odious. But mm-hmm. it's very, very easy to, in this day and age of like, I sound so old, but in the day and age of social media, yeah. you know, you very easy start to compare and go down a rabbit hole of comparing your career to other people's or your life to other people's life, your coffee to other people's coffee. Yeah. It's like, oh, but you know what? Like, who cares? Yeah. Do something from you and it'll be good and it'll be interesting. Or yeah. if it's not, it doesn't matter. It's still yours and you're not copying. And I'd love to focus on that personally for you as who you are. But before we maybe go down that little rabbit hole, Mm. let me ask you, and I don't know a lot about the musical theatre industry. I've done little bits here and there. However, sometimes you have to fit a costume. Sometimes you have to sing in a particular way that maybe doesn't come naturally to you. Sometimes you have to replicate a performance in order to be in the at the top of the game on the Broadway shows on the West End. You have to deliver lines in a way that maybe you wouldn't deliver them. So in an industry like musical theatre, which sometimes I view as it's an industry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How do you go, I'm going to bring Claire even though they might want me to be singing it like Cynthia Erivo? It's a great question. I'm still figuring it out. Um, But it's a necessity for me. Yes. I, so that's a loaded question, which is great. But like within the industry, there are ways where you could 
spend your entire career going from being the, you know, 15th Christian Chenoweth as Glinda to Mm -hmm. being the 26th Christine in Phantom to being the... 43rd and there is nothing wrong with that oh my god it's absolutely Im- it's not. like actually an amazing wage and incredible like it's amazing it, those are amazing and difficult complex roles and they seem and you're easy. living your dreams exactly so there are that's one path and all roads are good and i don't like but it's not the road that i want because i always feel a little a little like I'm in a straitjacket <laughs> mm. when I'm in those situations and I thrive I know that as an artist I thrive most when I'm originating a role because there mm. is no person before me it's just me and I get to like put in anything so that is I think why I have actually done a lot of originating roles like um a lot in plays and in musicals because that's where I fly the most right so you can you can carve out your own path within the industry that you want you don't have to conform (laughs) if you don't want to now like it's also really it's quite a skill to be able to do that i've seen the different galindas bring themselves to christian chenoweth's initial molding right absolutely it's a real skill but you do have to lift or like hit the mark where the light bings at this exact moment and lift the wand at a certain moment in order for it to like signal it's like learning choreography Mm -hmm. so i think it's closer to like maybe a ballet dancer learning a ballet gotcha so there's still is enormous skill involved but it's a different kind of skill to originate something i think um yes and that's what i love to do and that's and I still love to do, to tell stories with music. And I stick by that is what musical theater is. I do sometimes feel like in Ireland, the only vision of musical theater is Wicked or Lion King. But there is more musical yeah. theater out there that I would sometimes say is like, people think it's like play with music. Yeah. But that's musical theater to me. Yeah. Hades Town. There are some mm-hmm. brilliant new musicals out there. Brilliant. When did you figure out that you thrived most doing it your way? And I asked that off the back of wondering when you first went and studied, was it UArts? Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know that immediately. That's yeah. Not at that's all. That's what I'm wondering. I'm like, did you go over and be like, oh, yeah. I'm going to be Glinda. I'm going to be the yes, 16th I, Glinda. Yes, I did. In fact, two fun facts. I signed one is to do with Ariel and the other is to do with Glinda. So I sang popular for my audition to get into school. So that and then so I went and auditioned for Ariel on Broadway as I was. I thought you were talking about Ariel like, (laughs) you know, with the ribbons in the sky. And I was like, okay. But Ariel, I do do I do do Ariel. I know you do that. That's why my mind went there. Ariel the Little Mermaid. So I went audition Beautiful. for Ariel the Little Mermaid on Broadway, and I thought Claire O'Malley, red hair. You know, I can do wheelies on the, my shoes. Mm-hmm. I can bloody well do this. And I sang it the way I sang it, and and I did something with my arms. And I remember the audition. The casting director was like, "Excuse me, uh, please don't do the Sierra arms." And Sierra was obviously. The original yeah and so sierra bogus yeah, isn't it? yeah. she's beautiful amazing yeah. vocalist uh they thought i was trying to imitate her in the audition and okay. said that to me and i was like huh i worked i was like i'm not i was just being me yeah but i don't know it was just a strange experience it was not a good one okay uh, and it put a bad taste in my mouth and from then i started to figure out and, you know, I auditioned for, like, the Anastasias and things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, so I don't want to say anymore. But all to say, okay. I I quickly figured out that it wasn't where I was most comfortable. Wow. Yeah. And there are, now there are more roles for women that are complex and nuanced. Um, but, you know... There aren't there, and especially also the people in the driving seat, you know, who do you have as your director that can make or change something 
like yes Nelly in South Pacific you can look at that and be like oh she's one dimensional um, but actually depending on who you have directing that you could make that much more complex mm -hmm. so that plays a big part in it too so I've learned that whoever I'm working with and collaborating with that's really important to me Wow. and it, it, sh it shapes your experience of a of a role depending on who's behind the table collaborating with you yeah Wow. Okay. It's so interesting. I feel like I'm sitting here and <laughs> I don't I'm really realizing those however many years, the 20s, let's say. The 20s. Was really a big part of your life and actually as a friend, which I don't think is a bad thing, but I missed it all. So I missed getting to know you and my it's really being like presented to me that I'm like I know Claire O'Malley up to 18 <laughs> and then Claire O'Malley today yeah but there's so much growth in, in between know. and I yeah but that's another thing about just to go back to what I was saying about the comparisons and like seeing social media and things like we don't show the like the struggle on there right we don't show and, and when we initially you know, see people, we all don't present the struggle. We present like, you know, hope, well, we try to present the best version yeah. of ourselves usually. I mean, I don't know. So, yeah, but there's so, there's so much peddling that goes on and like, and work that yeah. goes into a life and a career. And, and you know, I, I wonder... Like, because I look at people that, like, I really respect. I'm like, oh, they have it so easy. Or, like, you know, if they save that. And I'm like, no, they fucking, excuse me, can I can't curse? Yeah, you can curse. Like, they've worked so hard for this. Nobody gets to where they are without hard work. I don't think, anyway. I, I really don't. Either. I really don't. Like, you're not here in, like, this lovely setup now. Because, like, you thought about an idea. You're the germ of an idea. And you grew it. And you grew it. And you grew it. And then you were able to be like, hey, want to come to, like my thing and talk about art for a while like how cool is that but that's because you have hustled to get to where you are you know nothing yeah. comes easy for especially not in the arts my god i know we have to really want it you do and you've got to be resilient and stick it out and yeah and it's tiring it is tiring but it's essential now Fergal, more than ever because look at how bleak the world is and everyone, I don't care if you're in finance and you don't give a rat's ass about musical theatre or theatre or storytelling, but everyone in the pandemic went to storytelling when they started binging Netflix yeah. and movies and music. Like, art is how, like, a lot of, most people survived. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, like, actors, artists, creators, writers, editors like everything all these podcasts everything is how is like how people have functioned so it is essential yeah it's essential it is let's circle back around to this quote and to what it means to you as a person I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit through talking about um how you approach yourself as an artist but anything you do let it come from you then it will be new as Claire O'Malley why is that quote important to you? Well, I cling on to it as a reminder of if I do do it from like the kernel of myself that is real, that I know and trust is real inside me, then it won't be like anyone else and it doesn't need to be like anyone else and it will be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And the more candid and truthful I get with myself, and then sharing that, the more I think it starts to resonate with other people. Can you think of a really simple way that you've done that in the last while? I mean, the, the, the work that I have been putting on during the pandemic and like the, the music concert that we did together and then the play that I just did and even just to go back to the anything we're holding on to, like I needed to express that even though my dream singer was singing it. I was like, well, if I do it from me, I mean, 
all of those things combined add up to survival mode of Claire. And I think the sharing of the anything worth holding on to video was the first step in that. Of like, if I share something really dark and truthful and vulnerable about myself, other people will feel less alone. Because that's how I felt when I watched it. Mm -hmm. So it serves purpose of being like, and that's why I wanted to do it in the cabaret, because I was like, it's my first time to get to perform in front of an audience again. What do I want? What golden nugget do I want to leave with them? Because that's always so important to me. And I thought this, if there's anyone, just one person sitting out there that feels like trash, that needs to know that they aren't alone and that this might help them out of this dark place, I'm going to do this for them. Yeah. And it can just be one person. Yeah. And that's enough. Exactly. Or it can just be yourself and that's enough. Exactly. Um, when when are you not in sur- survival mode? Oh my God. That's a good question. interesting uh, it's not necessarily like how do you mean survival mode in in what like from the sense i get from you and that i know you you're resilient you work you're hard working you are still you know who you are you know what your dreams are you you are Following that path of going, I will make these come true for myself. But I didn't always. And I hope that's coming clear. Like, I I didn't always know that. Well, I guess... Well, I didn't always know my exact path. I guess I did always know that I wanted to do this. And I wanted to create and perform. You always had the fire in your belly, I felt. Yes, yes, yes. And I feel, and I may be wrong, but I feel when you've got that fire in your belly, Mm because I've had it before, you keep going. Mm -hmm. And you keep going. What can I do next? Mm -hmm. What can I... Go, go 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 and in a way Mm. by you expressing that it's a survival mode i'm wondering do you ever step off the train and go do you know what i'm not going to keep going for a second and just not be in survival mode for a second i may be wrong it's interesting because i feel it the opposite i feel like the creating is the thing that keeps me alive and is my anchor like whenever I feel completely lost I will take myself back to the work and no matter what the relationship I'm in or Mm -hmm. what's going on around me with family you know that is the thing that keep that like helps me survive that's how I see it it Mm -hmm. is my survival Mm mm-hmm I love that. But the, yeah, I mean, there is, of course, there's like the rat race, you know. Yeah. When you're in New York. And that's why I feel very lucky to have, to be able to straddle both sides of the pond. Because I I love to be able to get out of New York for a little bit to reflect. I mean, the last week in New York was a complete whirlwind. First of all, I was holed up in my apartment trying to not get sick because I was like, I'm headlining. I can't get sick. If I get sick, nothing happens. The show is canceled. All these tickets sold. Like there's a lot on your head when it's just you. So I was holed up in the apartment and then all of a sudden I was on the main stage and I, I needed to deliver. Yeah. Because I had one night and I was like, well, I got to do this. And it's like, I got to perform. So yeah, that was a high stakes high pressured situation now once as soon as i walked out on stage i relaxed but like leading up to that i was nervous i guess the most like Lawrence olivia puked before every performance did you know that no he suffered from really bad stage fright he puked side stage for every time he did a role i'm gonna do something very strange and almost you do something strange me answer (laughs) your question for you yeah do it from what i got there is you're in survival mode i I got it from the last couple of things you said (laughs) and then when you stepped on stage you relaxed so actually coming off survival mode being present 
is just the doing it. Just yes. performing. Just doing it. And maybe that ties into when you're in your cabin out the back garden and <laughs> you're just singing the song. You're yeah. all, you're not worrying about you've you've taken away the worry of how many tickets, where will I be? Mm-hmm. Who do I need to contact? Email blah, you come to the work and Yeah, it's the escape. Could that be correct? That's very that's thank you. <laughs> that's that sounds about right yeah and and so many i think that's say, incredible that's such a gift but it's your job to find a job right so then once you find the job you're like oh, yay now i get to do all the fun stuff i think that's such a gift i don't know if i have that i think it's even a- when i still perform i'm still have the pressure with me so i think it's so wonderful and i think that's why i asked the question being like when do you come off survival mode because for myself, I was like, I come off it when I, I almost stop doing it all. Interesting. And that's why I haven't stepped away from music. I do it every single day of my life. But I've stepped away from the pressure of it. And I'm finding a new lease within just the creating part, just the doing part. So it's amazing to actually hear you go, I'm in the rat race. I'm in survival mode. But then when I'm doing it. And what, can I ask you a question? <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> and the table's turn. So do you, how do you feel when you sing? I think, do you know what? I don't think I'm ready to answer that because I think that that's changing at the moment. Because mm-hmm. um, I think I'm realising a lot and I'm singing every day for myself and what I like to do and... I'm not ready to articulate that yet. So interesting. It's like, again, from like from anyone's outsider's perspective, with like the gorgeous, booming voice that you have, people be <laughs> like, oh, wow. Like, you know, that must be so effortless. And then... You but know, I you think, think you summed it up. It's how you feel. Mm-hmm. It's how it makes you feel. It's yeah. how it makes you tick. It's how it makes you survive. Yeah. You know, and... It's finding the right material too, sorry. I mean, yeah. And it's that give and take. Mm-hmm. You know, you can give and be appreciated for what you're giving. Yeah. But if you're not giving back to yourself, then the giving will eventually just burn you out. Truth. You know. A Claire. Lot, a lot of truth bombs. <laughs> a lot of truth bombs. Just grab this mic and... <laughs> Claire, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank I am you. um, your biggest... I was about to say friend. I'm your biggest friend. No, yeah. I'm your biggest fan. Likewise. But I am like Likewise. such thank you. I'm so privileged to just be your friend and have all our gorgeous yeah. conversations. That's and so honoured that you came on and that we just got to record one of these conversations and have it this is so out cool. there forever. Yeah, right? You know? We'll look back on this time. Yeah. And be like, we were amazing. <laughs> no. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Claire for joining us. And thank you for you guys for listening, for watching. Um, and yeah, reach out to me on at Let's Talk About the Arts on Instagram. Um, and let us know what your thoughts are or, you know, how you feel about anything that we spoke about or if you want to challenge either of us in anything we've said that's how conversation starts talk to Fergal about it